NASA is developing its next generation spacesuit, which will be suitable for trips to the International Space Station, the Moon, and Mars, as outlined in its program for exploration called Constellation. For the new suit, NASA has proposed a completely new design, a plug-and-play system, so that these same arms, legs, boots, and helmets can be used with different suit torsos. It will consist of two configurations, one for launch and re-entry, and emergency operations in zero gravity. The second will be used for lunar excursions. The Space Agency has awarded a 500 million, six and a half year contract for the design and development of the Constellation spacesuit to Houston based Oceaneering International. The company has partnered with the Worcester, Massachusetts based David Clark Company, which has been developing spacesuits for the U.S. Space Agency since the 1960s. Basically, for configuration one, you would have a unique soft torso assembly. So everything from the neck ring uh, down to that disconnect ring here uh, and to the side disconnect here, the side bearing. Okay. Uh, so if you were, we'll, we'll, go, we'll walk through a typical day in the life of the mission. You would put on that suit basically and launch up to uh, International Space Station. Uh, if you were going to do a contingency EVA for whatever reason, if you needed to do a zero-G EVA, uh, you would take off the exterior cover, which in this case is blue up here, and you would replace it with a uh, uh, orbital TMG. Uh, it's basically, here's an example of one on a glove, but um, they're traditionally white, um, but it, it's a multi-layer uh, garment that incorporates mylar and scrim. Uh, it provides insulation, warmth, and it also protects if there are any micrometeoroid impacts, anything that could possibly damage the, the glove underneath. So you'd put a garment like this uh, over the entire suit and go off and do your contingency EVA. Uh, if you were deciding to go onto the lunar surface, however, what you would basically do is you would take off your arms. Uh, there's, this, would, this ring would have a disconnect feature. You'd be able to take your arms off. You'd take your legs off, and the core portion of the suit here, the soft torso, you'd put that in storage. Uh, you'd then get your configuration two uh, torso out, which is designed to interface with that PLIS portable life support system. Uh, it doesn't have a pressure seal enclosure. It has an alternate entry method, which is over here. We can show you that shortly. Uh, and then you would take those arms and legs and plug it onto the other configuration torso. Uh, that would give you the orientation that you needed for your helmet to improve the downward visibility as you're walking on the lunar surface uh, and incorporate some of the other features that you would need to do that uh, planetary surface uh, EVA. The first thing that you'll see is it looks similar in some ways to the ACES suit that we fly on shuttle. It's pretty much soft in the torso here, and it's soft in the legs. There's not a lot of hardware down here, which is very comfortable. It speaks to that IVA mode where you want to be able to move around for pretty freely. Um, you can see we do have bearings up here, uh, up in the psi area and in the bicep area. And this, this allows for a lot of motion when the suit is pressurized. Any pressure suit, when it's inflated, wants to lock up. It's basic mm -hmm. physics. The gas expands out against the fabric, and it wants to lock up. So we have to provide mobility in the areas that we need it. So as you can see, with the hard elements up here, this suit is really designed to provide you with arm mobility. So it would be either you're pressurized in your vehicle. In other words, you've lost your in-cabin pressurization, your suit's inflated, but you still need to flip switches and fly the vehicle. But there's not, there's not a lot of hard elements down here. You're not going to be walking around pressurized, so that's why you don't see a lot of hard elements. Um, the other thing you'll notice is the fabric patterning here. It's a lot more complex than what you typically see on the ACES suit. Uh, this provides you with enhanced mobility at higher operating pressures. Uh, the ACES is designed to be pressurized to about 3.5 PSI. Uh, this suit could be worn up to 8 PSI, so you need to have the fabric bending and folding. Uh, we do that through the use of what's called convolutes, convolute joints. Basically, if you think of um, a cylinder, just a tube, and if you pressurized it and you tried to bend it, it takes a lot of force to bend it because what's happening is you're compressing the volume, so the pressure's going up and the fabric doesn't want to bend that way. So what we do is we put, basically, you think of an accordion uh, in the joint. So as we're collapsing the joint on the inside and the fabric's folding, it's expanding at the top. We're maintaining the volume of the joint, so we're minimizing the work that you need to do to compress it under pressure. 
And that's why you see all these, uh, these design features here. We use them in the shoulder, we use them on the elbow, and we use them in the knee. Very, very effective for those large, these are called single axis joints. Uh, in other words, they only bend in one way, if you will, along one axis. Uh, there's no ankle mobility as part of this suit. You don't see any fancy bearings down here or boots designed to walk on a, on a planetary surface. And the reason is, again, this suit would be worn in the configuration one mode, launch entry and abort, uh, and contingency EVA, zero G EVA, where you don't need that type of mobility. All right. This is just basically the core of the suit, so it includes the gas container, the balloon, if you will, that holds the pressure, uh, and the restraint that gives the suit its shape. Uh, on top of this, you could either add an exterior cover, which this is an example of a short one, uh, or you could have your TMG, which is a much heavier, bulkier, insulative type garment that prevent, protects you against uh, micrometeoroids uh, and things such as that. On the back of the suit, uh, the thing that you see that's probably the most pronounced is the pressure sealing closure here. Um, this is basically a fancy way of saying we have a, a zipper uh, that holds air. So it allows us to get in and out of the suit. That would open up and the suit would uh, uh, be donned that way. Uh, but it's very, very comfortable. It's not, uh, it's not a big, rigid element that could potentially harm you uh, if there was some type of uh, off-nominal landing, impact, uh, etc. And that's the biggest thing. It's designing suits that are comfortable, uh, very conformal, that give you all the mobility that you need uh, to do the job at hand. Uh, when you're doing uh, launch entry and abort type activities, again, you want a very lightweight, very comfortable suit. Uh, when you're doing EVA, working on satellites, or building things in the vacuum of space, the suit needs to be a lot bulkier and heavier and incorporate more rigid elements such as this. So it's those disparate requirements that present the biggest challenge in terms of, uh, in terms of designing this next generation of equipment. So that's why we're looking at this single suit to do everything. We actually start getting prototypes uh, into the field, into NASA, in the next uh, year and a half, two years, and they'll start using them. Don't forget, this is but one component of the Constellation program. Uh, as we get higher fidelity equipment into mock-ups, uh, and as the maturity of those mock-ups increases, we'll learn more. We'll learn more about the interfaces, things that the suit will have to do, uh, and may in fact have to go back and, and redesign certain components. You know. Right now, we're designing to a set of requirements which exist on paper. Uh, so I can tell you what the range of motion has to be for a particular joint and what the torque has to be for that joint. But once we get that in an actual representative mock-up, we may learn that, well, that range of motion really needs to be expanded to accommodate some other control that was added by another group on the vehicle side that we know nothing about. So then we'd have to go back to the drawing board and, and uh, consider that. So. It's, a, it's an iterative process, and uh, what we're developing now are just the first generation prototypes uh, for this unique equipment.